Good morning. Once again, it's good to be with all of you this morning. I appreciate uh, the invitation to be able to speak with you this morning. I hope the lesson will be something that will be encouraging, but also instructive to all of us. If you would open your Bibles to James chapter 1, James chapter 1, that's going to serve as the text for our lesson this morning. And while you're doing that, I have a story I need to tell you about a little boy and his BB gun. Most of us, little boys that grew up in the country, had BB guns, and I had one or two as I was growing up as well. We lived on about 20 acres up in North Texas, up north of, uh, uh, north of Dallas, between Dallas and, and Denton. And on that 20 acres, there was about a two and a half acre plot that was cut out for my mother's aunt and uncle, my great aunt and uncle that lived there next to, next to us. They had actually helped raise my mother when she was a, a youngster there in Denton. And so they moved out there with us and we took care of them. They helped take care of us in some ways as well. My aunt, my great aunt, Lily was her name. She was very, very fond of things outside. She was very artistic in her own way. Uh, she, she made a lot of things that, to serve as decorations for the yard. And one of the things that she really loved was birds. Now, she didn't like all kinds of birds, but she did like birds that were songbirds. And so she had bird houses all over. Well, she didn't mind me having a BB gun so much as long as I didn't mess with her songbirds. Now, I could take care of blue jays, and I could take care of sparrows, and I could take care of other kind of birds like that that she didn't care for. But as long as I left her blue birds and red birds, cardinals, and whatever else alone, I was fine, and she was all right with that. One day, I was out with my BB gun, and for some unknown reason, and this was, now keep in mind, this was 50 or so years ago, I, I, and I haven't thought about this a whole lot until just recently. But I was out my BB gun, and for some reason, I took a shot at a bluebird. Not a blue jay, but a bluebird. And I hit it. And I knew that if my aunt found out about it, she would be terribly upset with me. So I commenced to try to hide it. I've got 20 acres that I could hide that on plus another 20 acres that my grandparents owned next to us, plus acres in the woods across the road from us, I could have taken it. I could have buried it in a garden. I don't know what possessed me, but I found a trash can lid out in the backyard, and I stuck it under the trash can lid. A day or two later, she came to me, and she asked me if I shot that bluebird. Now, I don't know what possessed her to go pick up the trash can lid. But the long story short is this. She found out, that I had killed one of her precious bluebirds, and she was making me accountable for it. Well, of course, I had to confess to her that that's what I did. A few weeks ago, when we had, a, when I was preaching, we talked about the prodigal son, and we talked about the predicament that he got in when he took his inheritance and he spent it all in the far country. And while he was in the hog pen trying to figure out what he was going to do to get out of that situation, he made up his mind to make a confession. I didn't go confess to my aunt until she brought it to me. But I did make a confession to her as to what I'd done. And it hurt me to do that. It hurt me to see her hurt because I had done what I had done and so on and so forth. James talks about confession in James chapter, uh, James chapter 5. I may have said chapter 1 already, but James chapter 5 is where we need to be. Verses 13 through 18. James writes, Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save him that is sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he's committed sins it shall be forgiven him. Confess therefore your sins one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The supplication of a righteous man avails much and it's working. Our lesson today has to do with confession. Not our confession of our faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that we typically make before we're baptized, but confession of sin. Confession of sin and confession of the guilt of sin. And the power of that confession has to free us spiritually. In our text that we just read from James chapter 5, James is giving instructions to the church about certain things. He says, if any, is any among you suffering, let him pray. 
Suffering may go back to chapter 1, where he was talking about trials and difficulties and rejoicing in those things. And no doubt the people at that day and time, the church at that day and time, was, was experiencing a great amount of trial and suffering. So he says, if you're suffering, let him pray. If he's cheerful, then let him sing. And this is, this is another lesson altogether, I think, but how many of us do that? When we receive some good news, when something special has, has, has been blessed, has blessed us by God, uh, he has shown his hand of favor upon us in special ways, we may pray to him and thank him in prayer, but do we actually go to him and sing praise to him in gratitude and thanksgiving? Just something to think about. Then he says, if any among you sick, let him call for the elders. And let them anoint him with oil and pray over him. James tells us here that calling for the elders and praying for them is something that we, we should be doing. Anointing them with oil, I think, is a, uh, something that they did back then. I think it's a, to us today, I believe it would be any application of whatever medical, whatever medicinal need, or whatever medicinal, medicinal need, means are available to us or treatment might be available to us at the time. It's apparent that some of the sickness that's mentioned in this passage is physical. Notice that James says the prayer would save and restore the sick person and the Lord would raise him up. We have to keep in mind, too, that this was in the early days of the church. It might have been that some of the elders had been given the special miraculous power of the Holy Spirit to, to heal, or it may be that the Lord acted in such a way more readily than, than we might see or think that he acts today. But whatever the case was, when they prayed for him, they had to remember that if it was the Lord's will that that person should be healed, then that's what they need to remember, what the Lord's will would be. Some of the sickness also mentioned was related, no doubt, to spiritual conditions of the brethren. Because James ties that to the phrase, if he has committed any sins, they will be forgiven him. And then he says in verse 16, and this is the key part of our, our lesson this morning, Confess your faults or sins one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of the righteous man can avail much. And then James puts forth the prophet Elijah as an example of a man who was righteous, though he wasn't perfect. But when he prayed, God answered his prayer. It didn't rain for three and a half years, and when he prayed again, it would rain, then it did. The healing in verse 16 is that to be understood as physical healing, or is that to be understood as spiritual healing? No doubt it's primarily spiritual, because James says they will be, his sins will be forgiven him. But in addition to that, it could be physical as well. Sometimes our unconfessed sins can cause, uh, can, can result in physical pain and illness. We might call these psychosomatic illnesses or ailments where we have something going on in our emotions or in our soul or in our spirit that's not right, but it manifests itself in physical ways. Headaches, migraines, stomach aches, indigestion, high blood pressure, uh, heart problems, any host of things, sleepless nights, irritability, muscle tension, etc., etc., etc. All kinds of things can happen because we know that things aren't right internally with our mind or with our soul or with God. Unconfessed sin has the power to create physical problems uh, such as those. They also create spiritual problems. Unconfessed sin binds us, that is it enslaves us to behaviors that are continued to be sinful. They prevent us from being the servant that God has called us to be. And you might ask, well how is that? How does that happen? What causes this to happen? And how can we possibly overcome that or be healed from that type of sickness? The key to this is confession. It's admitting to God, to ourself, and to someone else that we have sinned, that we have done something that's wrong, and that we want to try to make it right. So our lesson this morning deals with sin and its consequences. The power of confession is what I've entitled this. And we're going to take a few minutes this morning to at least examine part, some, of this subject. It's hoped that we'll come away from this study with a better understanding of confession, its role in our lives as Christians, and how it 
how confession can be a powerful uh, tool to remedy us of the problems that we have with sin and the things that come along with it. As we think about this lesson or we think about the power of confession, let's notice first the deception of the, of the devil, the deception of Satan himself. Satan is called Satan, just that. He's also called the devil. One of the most common words that's found for him in the New Testament is diabolos, diabolical, we might say. The word there uh, is defined as traducer, which was really a new word for me. I had to look that up to see what that meant. Traducer or false accuser or slanderer. In fact, in Revelation 12 and verse 10, Satan there is described as the false accuser or the accuser implied in that is false accuser of our brethren. Also in John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus describes the devil or Satan as the liar and the father of it or the father of lies. The only tool that Satan has, the only tool that he has to hold us into his power and his grip is this. That is the lie. Deception. It's what he used with Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he used it successfully there. He used it against Jesus in the wilderness of temptation in Matthew chapter 4, but unsuccessfully because Jesus <laughs> counted that with the truth of God's word. And he used it on me and you constantly. The devil may say to us in some way, shape, form, or fashion, well, what you did really wasn't sinful. You, you, you're, not, you're not really a sinner. But we know that's a lie. He might say, well, you have sinned, yes, but there's no need to confess that sin. It'll all work itself out in the wash, so to speak. It'll all take care of itself. There's no need to, 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 to tell anybody else about those sins. Or he might tell us, if you tell the truth, if you fess up, if you confess your sins to someone, then what's that going to do? They're going to have a lesser view of you. They're not going to like you. They're not going to approve of you. They're going to think you're some terrible person. Your family, the church, the people you work with, they're going to reject you. And all of that is told us by Satan to convince us that it's not necessary to confess our sins one to another. God said in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find mercy. If we conceal, hide, cover up our sins, rest assured, if we're tempted to do that, rest assured that temptation comes from Satan himself. It's not instructions from God. It's the devil trying to maintain a hold upon us. God says that there's no prosperity and no mercy in covering up our sins. Satan doesn't want to us to confess because he wants to keep a hold on us. He wants to keep us bound in those sins. He knows what will happen once we confess them. Once we confess them, then we will feel a greater amount of freedom and release from that. We'll talk about that more later. Jesus said, you should know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, John 8, 32. If the truth sets us free, then that is used in contrast to lies and deception, which bind us, which chain us, which keep us under wraps by Satan. If you would, open your Bible to the Old Testament, the story of David in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. In 2 Samuel 11, we have a very familiar story of David and Bathsheba. And we'll just, we'll just kind of try to highlight some of the points in this to, to bring it to our remembrance. But David was supposed to be out with his army. Verse 1 of chapter 11 says, It came to pass at the return of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried at Jerusalem. Now, in Texas we have hunting season and we have football season and we have all kinds of seasons. Well, the Israelites in that day and time, they had a season for war. The time of the year when men went off to battle. I suppose it was after the winter uh, had come to an end, the ground is thawing out, and the, the snow and the ice and so forth had, had dissipated. Now so it's a good time to go out and get after it, to expand your territory. 
David had always gone with his army. He was the commander-in-chief. He had always been the leader of his armies. But on this particular occasion, he didn't go. He stayed in Jerusalem. And it came to pass that one evening when he was up on his housetop, he looked across the way and he saw a beautiful woman bathing. And he inquired about who she was. And he, they said, well, I don't know. So we'll go find out. So they found out who she was. And said, oh, that's, that's Bathsheba. That's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, unless you're concerned about David not knowing who Uriah the Hittite is, later on you'll find a list of David's mighty men. And the last one to be mentioned was Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was part of David's secret service, so to speak, part of his bodyguard, one of his mighty men that's mentioned. So David knew who he was. But even knowing that, he sent some of his servants, to fetch Bathsheba and to bring her back to David. He spent the night with her, had an illicit affair with her, and then sent her home. Then about two months later or so, she finds out that she is carrying his child, and so she sends word to him. Now the great cover-up begins. What am I going to do about this sin that I've committed? And so David calls for Uriah to come home, and if Uriah would come home and spend a couple of nights with, with Bathsheba, his wife, then that would cover up everything. Everybody would suspect that the baby was his and wouldn't have any suspicion about David at all or anybody else. But Uriah was too good a man to do that. Uriah would not leave his fighting cohorts out there on the field of battle and come home and enjoy the pleasures that he could have had with his wife at home. So he stayed. He stayed away from the house. David, having been foiled on two occasions to do that, then he sends Uriah back to Joab. And he sends with him a note, which turned out to be his own death warrant, his death sentence. Joab, you take Uriah, and you put him in, the hot, in, the, in front of the hottest battle, and you back away from him, and then tell me how it goes. Well, of course, we know how it went. Uriah went and fought. He got into the, into the place where Joab sent him, but nobody fought with him. And so in that battle, he was killed, which made David actually a murderer. So word gets back to David. It gets back to Bathsheba. Bathsheba goes through a time of mourning, a month or whatever it might have been. And then after that's over with, David then, trying to do the right thing, takes her to be his wife. But chapter 11 ends with these words. The thing displeased the Lord. God wasn't happy. Chapter 12. Enter Nathan the prophet. The child has been born already. Nathan comes and talks to David. Tells David a story about a rich man who had many, many flocks and herds. And his poor neighbor, who only had one baby ewe lamb. The rich man had some unexpected company one night. And so instead of taking from one of the flocks and herds that he had many of, he went to his poor neighbor's house and stole that one baby ewe lamb. That added his table and slept in his bed and was to him like a, another child. And he killed that lamb, and he dressed it, and he served it up for dinner for his guest. David was incensed about that. He said, how could this happen? He said, this man deserves to die, and he needs to repay that man fourfold. Nathan, standing before the great king of Israel, probably shaking in his boots, said, David, you're the man. You're the man, David. And it wasn't until... It wasn't until Nathan had told David that he, that he was the, the, the man that had done that that David said unto Nathan, verse 13 of chapter 12, I have sinned against Jehovah. Finally, David confesses his sin. Nathan, being the prophet of God, had instructions from God. He said, he said okay. Nathan said unto David in verse 13, he said, Jehovah also has put away your sin, that is, he's forgiven you, and you shall not die. Howbeit, because of this deed, you have given great occasion for the enemies of Jehovah to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed to his house. We know the story, the rest of the story, how the child got sick. David prayed for the child for about a week and fasted while he prayed, and the child still died. And David got up and he took a bath and he put, changed his clothes and went to the house of worship and he got him something to eat. And the people thought, that's weird, weird behavior. And David says, well, 
He said the child is dead. While he was alive, there was a chance that he might, that God might restore him, but I can't bring him back, but I can go to be with him. Psalm 32, if you would turn to that psalm for just a few minutes. Psalm 32 is a psalm that David wrote as he reflects upon these events. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, he says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity and whose spirit there is no guile. Here David talks about the blessing that comes to the person that's been forgiven. And what he's doing here, he's setting up uh, the, the situation by telling us the result of what's happened. Why does David think that there's such a blessing in being forgiven? Why does he think there is such a blessing in this? And notice what he says in verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all the day long. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture was changed as with the drought of summer. David was, in, was going through a very, very difficult time, not only emotionally, not only spiritually, but I think also physically. He's, re, he's reaping some physical effects of his lack of confession. Keep in mind that David has been living with these sins for the better part of a year at least. David committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he had Uriah, her husband, killed. And it wasn't until after the child was born, nine months later, we'd guess, and maybe even sometime after that, that Nathan actually came and approached David. And David has been living with this sin. Here's David, the man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel. And for the better part of a year, God is not anywhere in his life. Because he has committed some grievous sins, adultery and murder, deception and all kinds of things. And he's living with the guilt of that. And it's just wearing him out physically. But look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto Jehovah. And you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. With that in mind, David could say, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom Jehovah does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile, no deceit. David could say that because he's learned that lesson. He's learned that very, very valuable lesson of the power of confession. When David hid his sins for that year, it wasn't fun. He was in bondage. He was in chains to those sins. But when he finally confessed them, he was released. The deception of the devil. The devil deceived Eve. The devil tried to deceive Jesus. And the devil certainly deceived David. And he deceives us as well from day to day. We commit sins and we may commit habitual sins. We may commit repeated sins that we're living with and maybe even keeping, keeping hidden from other people because we don't want them to know how bad a people we are. And so as we look at what the Bible says about this confession, we see the, the necessity of it and the benefit that comes from it. What is it that we are confessing? Well, we are to confess basically the exact nature of our wrongs. Someone could say, well, preacher, I, I've got to confess that I'm a sinner. I said, okay, that's good. That doesn't tell me anything. Because the Bible says we're all sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. That's not saying any more than, as one person put it, that I need air to breathe. Because that's true for all of us. We all sin. But what is the exact, exact nature of that sin? What is it that we have done? That's, the, that's what we've got to get to. We've got to target that sin so that we can actually then do something about it. We don't have to give all the explicit details relative to, related to the sin. We, what we're looking at is the big picture, maybe some parts of the big picture, but not the individual tiles of that mosaic. You don't intend to neglect or gloss over the important parts of your life that led to the sin, but we realize that I've already identified a lot of that, and maybe if my sins are habitual, it's a continual thing in my life, if it's some addiction, so to speak, 
then I go through these same processes over and over again. Once I identify the process, I don't have to think about it each time. There's no need to continually repeat in my confession. But what is confession? What is this confession of the nature of our wrongs? One writer by the name of Theodore Jennings wrote this. He referred to confession as a, a point of sober, clear-sighted self-assessment. For here we declare not who we would like ourselves to be, but who we really are. We acknowledge our bondage and our brokenness. If we are oblivious to this, we cannot turn away from it or toward the promised freedom. A point of clear-sighted self-assessment that we have to come to if we want to be free from the bondage and the chains of those sins. To whom do we confess? Well, first we confess to God. And this might be the easiest part of the process for several reasons. Number one, God already knows what we've done. When I confessed to my Aunt Lily about the bluebird, she already knew what I'd done. She knew it had to be me because there's nobody else in the house that had a BB gun go out there and shoot a bird. So I, it wasn't hard for me to confess that. I could have tried to lie my way out of it. I don't think I did. But I told her, yes, I did that. So it is with God and us. When we confess to God, he already knows what we've done. So then you might ask the question, why should I confess in the first place? Because, you see, he wants to be a father and us to be his children. And he wants, to come to, he wants us to come to him as a child would come to a father in trust and love to confess those sins unto him. What he wants is honesty. He doesn't want us to continue to try to hide and deny our sinfulness. Another reason why it's easier to confess to God is because he's not going to tell anybody else. He will keep it confidential. He's not going to write it up in the church bulletin. He's not going to put it on the internet. It's just between us and him. He's also promised to forgive. And he's abundant in his loving kindness and his mercy, which prompts his forgiveness. He's promised to forgive, and when he forgives, he also forgets. That is, to the extent he doesn't bring it up to us again. Micah chapter 7, verse 19 says that he will trod them under his foot, that is our sins, under his foot, and cast them into the very depths of the sea. God has made that promise, and God keeps his promises. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, John writes, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, then we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So, what does John say? He says, well, if we fail to confess to God, then what happens is we remain in denial of our own situation. We remain in denial of the truth of our sinfulness. If we fail to confess to God, then we're actually calling God a liar because God has said we are sinners. We're rejecting his truth and we're putting ourselves above and in a place above and in the place of him on the throne of our hearts. If we confess to him, then John says he is faithful and just, righteous, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not just some, not just a little, but all unrighteousness, whatever it might have been. So we confess to God first. Then we confess to ourselves. Now, this sounds somewhat backwards because, well, I, I probably have to confess to myself, acknowledge to myself before I confess it to God. Well, that's true to some degree, but there's a greater confession that comes after that to self. I think it comes in, in bits and pieces. It may seem a bit backwards at first, but in our confession to God, actually what we do, we make ourselves more acutely aware of the wrongs we've committed against God and how they've affected him and how they've broken his heart. And in realizing that, then we can come to ourselves and say, no, I really have messed up. I've messed up a whole lot worse than I thought I had. And so once we become aware of that, we actually internalize that and make it a part of, of, our, of our inner thinking. And by admitting them to God first, we're also reminded about what Jesus says about putting God first in our lives. Confessing to him first instead of then, and then confess to us later. And then thirdly, and the most difficult part, is confessing to another human being. This is difficult because we don't know how they're going to react 
We don't know what they're going to do, what they're going to say. We don't want other people to see our shortcomings. We don't want to look weak in front of other people. We're afraid that we will not, that they will not keep the matter confidential, that they will publish it in the bulletin or put it on the internet. We might fear they'll judge us. They'll not look at us in the same light. We fear that they may use it against us as a matter of control over us. I think part of the, the reason the, the Roman Catholic Church has a confessional uh, practice is so the church keeps control over its people that way. The confession we're talking about here is not a public confession of wrongdoing when one responds to the invitation necessarily. Sometimes that's necessary. You might be asking the question, when is that necessary? It's necessary, I think, whenever our sins affect the whole congregation publicly. Brother Wendell Winkler, in our studies back at Brown Trail years and years ago, he had this rule of thumb. He says the confession should only be, need only be as public as the sin was. If the sin's a private matter, then confess it privately. If it's a personal matter with one other person, then Jesus has a prescription for that. Go to them first and tell it to him and him alone. If that doesn't work, then you take somebody else with you. But by someone coming to the congregation on a Sunday such, such as this and, and, and confessing some sin that nobody knows about, it becomes an announcement of sin more so than a confession of guilt. And that's not necessary. However, sometimes that is necessary if it's a public sin, if it's a public matter. And sometimes in the mind of the one who's doing the confessing, they may think that it's necessary for them so that they might get it off their chest. Primarily what we're talking about here is confessing to another individual. To whom would we confess? Well, it could be anyone. It wouldn't have to be the preacher. It wouldn't have to be elders necessarily. But there's some qualifications that might want to be considered. First, is it someone that, I, that will keep it a confidential matter? That will be just between me and them. Is it someone who's really concerned about my spiritual well-being who wants to help me to grow stronger? Do they have a strong biblical foundation to help in such matters? Has the person that I'm about to confess to, have they struggled with the same sin and overcome it? And therefore, they, do they have experience in that and some help in how to get me through that as well? As, in talking to someone like that, you might say, oh, really? Did you have that same problem as well? I thought I was the only one with the problem. One of the things that sin, hidden sin, does to us is it causes us to feel isolated, isolate ourselves from everybody else. We don't want people to get too close to us because we don't want everybody to find out what's in our closet. But cleaning out the closet is sometimes or can be a very, very good thing. Gary Holloway wrote a commentary on James and Jude. And in that commentary, he comments on the passage that we read in James chapter 5 earlier. He says, This is one of the strongest encouragements to prayer found in Scripture. When faced with trouble, we pray to God. When sickness comes, it's fine to call the doctor. But we should also call the elders. We also should confess our sins to one another. If churches today had the closeness of the early Christians, we would not be so reluctant to be honest with one another about our shortcomings. We can also ask them to pray for us. Praying for others might even mean correcting them from deception and apostasy. No one is beyond the love of God. Even a multitude of sins cannot separate us from Him and His love if we humbly turn and follow Him. A question we might ask at this point is, you look at our announcements and our church bulletins, and I'm not just talking about ours, but I'm talking about brotherhood-wide across the board. Of all the announcements and prayer requests that are found there, how many of them, the majority of them rather, 95 to maybe 99% of them, are for things such as improved health and safety. Safety in travel, safety in places where there's storms and that kind of thing. How many of those prayer requests 
or for spiritual needs. How many of those spirit, uh, prayer requests are for help to walk closer with God? How many for reconciliation with other brethren? How many for the lost souls to respond to the gospel? We spend a whole lot of time talking about health and travel. But how much do we pray for these other things that are real spiritual needs? That are real spiritual concerns that we should have? Someone said Jesus didn't die for our health and our safety. He died for our souls. And for our souls to be right with him. And if we go through life with unconfessed sins, then we may have, as Freddie Anderson said, gate trouble on the day of judgment. Gate trouble, you know what that is? That's trouble getting through the pearly gate. If our sins are separating us from God and from our brethren, then we should be confessing them and seeking their forgiveness and God's forgiveness. What are the benefits of this type of confession? I've got five here listed. Number one, barriers created by feelings of isolation are removed. If we continue to hide our sin as David did, then we'll feel isolated from other people. But by confessing those sins to God and confessing them to whoever needs that confession, to, to hear that confession, then we remove those barriers of isolation. We remove those chains that bind us and keep us removed from other people. As sinners, we may feel like we're the only one that has the problem that we have, the only one that's involved in the sin that we're involved in, and that nobody else would understand. But the reality of the fact is that many people are involved in those same sins. We may not know that person until we start making those confessions. Everyone else, whether at church or those around us, in our mind is perfect and doesn't have such a problem as I have. Karl Barth wrote, that it is as and when we know that we are sinners, that we know that we are brothers. Secondly, we've begun to find real compassion from other people. I quoted from Jennings a few minutes ago in another part of the lesson. He says here, the confession of sins is the beginning of compassion. We share with our neighbors the need for liberation. The symptoms may vary, but the need is the same. Sins may vary, but sin is common to all. And through the confession of sins, we acknowledge our common need, our common brokenness, our common disfigurement, our common paralysis, and our common bondage. Once this has happened, we do not wish to exclude from our fellowship and friendship any who are sinners. Thirdly, it gives us a clear conscience. One writer said that confession is a matter of directly touching the conscience more profoundly than any other time and of purifying the mind more completely and deeply. A fourth reason is physical healing. James talked about that healing. We said it was partly spiritual but also partly physical. Pain relief is possible. David was under the throes of the guilt of his sin with Bathsheba and killing Uriah and all the deception that went involved in that. And it was physically wearing him out. But once he confessed that and acknowledged that to God and was forgiven, then the burden was lifted. And he was free. And that's our final one, is true freedom. Jennings put it this way. It's turning away from bondage. The gaining of an ability to see clearly. The practice in penetrating illusion, unmasking idols, exposing pretense and exposing our chains, holding them up so they may, may be struck off. The chains that bind us to Satan and to sin, exposing them so that they might be broken free, and we might be free again. The chains and the shackles of hidden sins that, that bind us or keep us bound in that sin, and keep us in bondage to Satan. We will never be free, truly free in Christ, if we continue to deny the sins that we are engaged in. Through love, through God's love and mercy and His grace, in our Lord Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven. We can be released. We can be set free. What sins do you have in your life that need to be confessed to God? What sins do you have in your life that need to be confessed to yourself? What sins do you have in your life that may need to be confessed to somebody else? Or you may need to seek some help 
from somebody else to, to deal with those sins. I don't know. Maybe you don't have any. But maybe you do. If you do, then please make those confessions as soon as possible so that you can begin to feel the true freedom that only Christ can give. If you're here this morning and you need to put on Christ in baptism, we want to give that opportunity as well. If you have some other need that, that you want to share with the congregation as a whole, we want to give that opportunity. We're going to sing an invitation song. If you feel the need at all to respond to that invitation, for whatever reason, why don't you come as we stand, as we sing.